sitting around the table, but I have my notes. Like some of the uh, professors that were like they're sitting around the table. Did you turn it in? Yeah, I got a really weird look and I walked in. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like, like, uh, hi. I was like, um, let's look at my RRB. And they go, oh, yeah, that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's really awkward. Yeah, I'm, I'm just checking. Yeah, yeah and then usually they're supposed to be the reception. So, okay. what time do we start? Uh, right now. Um, I said, it's, it's really important that we get the words right. And democracy. I, and the way in which we use it in, in the American um, usage is the same way we use everything. It's always driven by this kind of market sensibility or market mentality. It's like we believe we live in like this marketplace that's, that's um, filled with these goods that we fill up our basket and we kind of walk out with our purchases. And we're happy, uh, warm feeling we get inside because we have these things now that we can hold. Um, it doesn't work that way in democracy. You need a different type of language. It's for a different type of thing. It's for human associations. It's not for economic associations. You can't just go into the supermarket. Like if you're thinking about your democratic choices, you can't you can't go into like the Menominee market and just say, oh, I think I'll I'll pull down a little gay marriage and throw that in the shopping cart. Maybe maybe I'll grab a little abortion rights issue and throw that in there. And maybe what else am I missing? Maybe something else. Uh, I know, maybe we need to uh, loosen up tax policies and tax regulations, so you got to throw that in there. You don't head out to the checkout line with your, with your uh, cart full of goods and pull out your plastic and say, I'll take these things. This is my purchase of democracy for the day. It doesn't work like that. Uh, it creates this kind of rationalization of seeing everything in terms of a market mentality, creates a kind of material approach to some of these things that are actually really beautiful. Especially when it has things to do with, with the story of human association, sociability. And that's what the story of democracy is about. And that's what you have to get to, and you have to find the right language for it. You have to leave this kind of materialist approach to how we understand things, and our American market sensibility behind me, try and get into the, the nut of what this uh, democratic thing is all about. Not so you can understand what democracy has been, or not so you can understand what democracy is, but so you can understand what democracy can be, a language of possibilities. A language that goes outside of the kind of the dead letter of the social sciences or economics or rationalism or linear relationships between things. We need to be able to find a language of sociability to bring disparate ideas together, to make them compatible, to make hybrids, to make them grow, to make them a draw that can create associations between us. Now, we might like to think that there's this, this is direct correlation between the uh, free market and then the free democratic political associations that inhabit the American landscape. But in fact, that's not true. In fact, I would say that the market has got a negative effect on our ability to realize democratic freedoms and democratic sociability. Uh, in fact, we know about, a little bit about the birth of democracy. We know, I mean, Western Civ is pretty much dead. They're going to they're gonna pull my course probably in the next year or two. But we have some understanding of, of the story of democracy. Where, where was democracy born? Where was this, this, this the thing given birth and, and, and woke into the light? I mean, no? Where are we going to go? Greece. Greece? Yeah, Greece is a good place to start for democracy. Now, we think that the Greeks might know something about democracy. We might pay attention to the way in which it was brought into this world. You know... It wasn't purchased on a marketplace. It turns out that Solon didn't go down to the Agora and pick up a box of democracy and throw it in his shopping cart and take it out, right, at the Knicks to everyone and say, hey, look, we've got democracy now. And everyone applauded and said, oh, that's great. Let's go get some more products. It's not the way it worked. In fact, the birth of democracy is almost an anti-capitalistic endeavor. Now, when we look at the, the faces, the, the challenges that face Solon, he was brought into a world of Greek unfreedom. It was the fact that the way in which the, the, that the market worked, it created a huge degree of unfreedom among uh, the social classes within Athens itself. Um, the, the, the degree to which that there was unfreedom, it operated both in a political and an economic and on a, on a, um, a judicial nature as well. So we tried to adopt a new language that could tell a story that could disassociate themselves from the disassociative language in which they seemed to be trapped. Now, um, Solon's reforms are going to bring about a transformation in the political landscape of, of Athens in a way that seems subtle to us, but that are absolutely essential. He's going to create what we understand to be a middling philosophy. Um, it's based upon the idea, 
It's, it's like this is how democracy works. You can't walk into democracy and pretend you've got all the answers for everybody. Like, I know how to solve the health care problem. This is the way to do it. Um, I know how to grow uh, the American economy so it benefits everyone. You don't have the answers in a democratic logic. A democratic logic is a coming together of different ideas that then are raised to a higher degree of understanding by bringing disparity into association with one another. This is what the middle Eastern philosophy is all about. As a Democrat, small d Democrat, you've got to come humbly before the table of democracy with your hat in hand. I don't know everything. And we can find the answer by creating association of ideas. His middle Eastern philosophy was to create a new class within Athens itself. It creates a, a hoplite revolution. Small farmers. These guys were small potatoes. Five acres, maybe ten acre farms. Tops. Uh, based a, to give a new um, ethical or moral orientation to the idea of power within Athens itself. It was an understanding that was based upon participation, based upon association, and about bringing these disaffected members of society into the idea of Athenian power as a whole. It recreated the landscape subtly. These are democratic reforms because they allow sociability to begin to emerge. Now, Solon's reforms, he creates an ecclesia, a place for uh, exchange, a uh, council of 400. We insert members of the hoplite um, class within this council that never were before included before. And they start speaking alongside the aristocrats as well. And they start bringing a language of association from these formerly uh, disassociated members within society itself. Well, Solon, as all moderates understand, um, no one's going to be happy with what you do. It turns out that his reforms didn't satisfy the people at the bottom because they didn't go far enough. And the people on the top, the aristocrats themselves, they thought they went too far. And someone dropped the bomb and left. Ten years. Left Athens altogether and left Athenians to work it out. Well, here's the amazing thing about it. What grows the democracy in Athens, the Germanic reforms, it has grown under the form of a tyranny. Now, Pisces Stratus is going to be the tyrant that's going to take power after Solon leaves town. But what Pisistratus does was that he gives uh, time and space to the growth of these democratic institutions. It takes an anti-democratic tyrannical power to allow these kind of associative networks to come together. It's forced association. But over time, it starts to make sense. And these things begin to work together, especially under the, um, uh, the um, representation of the Council of 400, the Ecclesia itself. Pisistratus has a son, Hippias, and he starts um, uh, manifesting all the ugliest aspects of what a tyrant could be. And he starts pushing back some of the reforms that his father had instituted, the enlightened tyrant. Now, with Hippias, we start seeing a violent pushback, both from the aristocratic side and from the hoplite side, because he's taken away the reforms that started to make sense for both groups together. Now, Hippias, the tyrant, people start to figure, we've got to get rid of this guy. And the family that's going to do it is the family of Cleisthenes. Now, Cleisthenes is an interesting cat, because he comes from an aristocratic background. And it's a group, it's a family, a very powerful family called the Alcmeonidae. And these guys, they give us Pericles, they give us, they give us Cleisthenes, they give us all the big names. They're sort of like the Kennedys of the, of the uh, Athenian world. But um, Cleisthenes and his Alcmeonidae wealthy family, they start building associations that look for the ouster of the um, uh, uh, tyrannical uh, Hippias. And they do it in this most amazing way. The Alcmeonidae family bids out the contract to rebuild the Temple at Delphi. The Temple at Delphi was the most important religious institution in all of Greece. The, the Alcmeonidae build it out, they underbid, the, the, the uh, oracles at Delphi are like, sure, right? We'd love to have you guys rebuild it. And they build the most fantastic, beautiful, pristine, perfect, perfect little temple that they would never seen. They take money out of their own pocket. They go way over budget, but they don't charge the oracle. They pay it out of their own pocket. And it turns out they make friends with the oracle. And the oracle's like, wow, these are the only guy. These guys are good. And so when any other political group comes in to the uh, oracle of Delphi to figure out, well, should I do this political action or that political action? Should I advance in war itself? Should we go pursue peace? The first thing the oracle says is, well, after you uh, free the Athenians, and they're like, what the hell does that mean? And, and it happens to the Thebans, it happens to the Corinthians, and finally the Spartans, the biggest, baddest guys in the Peloponnese, come there for, for consultation with the oracle itself. And the oracle says, first free the Athenians. And they're like, oh, 
We're never going to get an answer to this guy. So they go and free the Athenians. And the Spartans join forces with Cleisthenes, and they oust Hippias. Now, the Spartans are like, well, we freed the Athenians. We're out of here. And in the aftermath, we assume that Cleisthenes and his, his uh, Alpheonid family is going to take power, but they don't. In fact, there's a struggle for power, and another fellow called Isagoras actually takes power, who is going to look to push back the reforms back to the way they were before uh, Solon itself. Cleisthenes hits the road, Isagoras takes power, but something amazing happens. Cleisthenes uh, uh, is, is uh, outside along with 700 important uh, reforming aristocratic families of Athens. They're outside of the city together. Cleomenes, the Spartan king, is uh, chatting with Isagoras about the development of the future of, of the aristocratic reforms that are going to push back uh, Salonian democracy in Athens itself. <clears throat> and in the context of that going on, it turns out the people get mad. They don't want to lose the ecclesia. They don't want to lose their representation. They don't want to lose the things that they became accustomed to, the democratic reforms they became accustomed to, under the guise of the leadership of, of, of um, uh, Pisistratus, the tyrant. And they... They hold up for three days, Cleomenes, king of Sparta, Isagoras, and their supporters on the Acropolis, and they don't let them out. And Cleomenes is like, to hell with this. I'm done with you, Athenians, man. You guys, I'm out of here. And they negotiate a peace, they take off, and the people come together, and they create a recall of Cleisthenes himself. And Cleisthenes, who in the words of Herodotus, formally detested the people, detested the deans, comes back in and is brought in as the great... Um, a democratic reformer. And he does. He institutes the Salonian reforms and pushes them even further. Now this is where democracy gets cooking, because it reorganizes people and creates new groups of force associations around this idea of the deans. Now, the way people normally look at democracy in terms of its Greek root, they call it the people, deans of the people, and kratia is the power. They call it people power. That's not how it works. The deems were the little villages. It was like a neighborhood, right, of association. It was a, it was a group that Cleisthenes created in order to force associations on a small micro level that could then empower people in terms of the larger um, uh, Athenian state. It was not people power, but it was uh, the uh, neighborhood uh, associations that are going to uh, write the nature of the democratic reforms in, in uh, ancient Greece. Um, the democratia is the realization of the middling philosophy of Solon. And so democracy gets started. You fight with your dean, you vote with your dean, dean you get your judicial representation through your dean, everything is through the dean. And it creates an association that allows people to create um, a, a sociability uh, within the larger structure of the democratic um, uh, uh, institution itself. Uh, this is the beginning. And it's the way in which this, this dialogue overcomes um, uh, the differences in class and, and um, uh, uh, blood and the ways in which these associations have taken root over time. But they don't stay that way in terms of this initial orientation. Who was the, what was the key? You guys remember, who was, what was the key to this Middle East philosophy? What was, the, what was the group within Athens that's going to represent part of what this Middle East philosophy is all about? Who are these guys? Remember these guys? Were they the doctors, the lawyers? <laughs> Who were they? <laughs> they, were the, they were the farmers, baby. All right. All right. <laughs> now, this is the key to grounding the nature of what this Middle East philosophy is all about. It overcomes the other aspects of class and disassociation that was operating in the, in the uh, Athenian background. Well, this was all hunky-dory to this point, but something happens in the Greek economy that starts pushing a small farmer out. The small farmer is the key to the dean, the key to this discourse of sociability. One minute left. <laughs> maybe, maybe three. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Uh, <laughs> the transformation uh, with uh, Themistocles. Uh, Themistocles is going to push Athens towards this movement of a, a merchant and uh, financial uh, orientation. Themistocles is, is a genius. He takes a silver strike, he builds, a, he builds a, a navy, a fleet for Athens. They become a dominant force in the Aegean, and they also have this other thing. They build a wall around Athens, all the way down to the port of Piraeus. Um, it creates a, 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 a turning of Athenian interests away from the farms and towards the sea itself. It becomes the thing that launches Athens from a second-rate power into a first-rate power, but it creates as a fundamental um, uh, challenge the state of Athenian democracy itself. 
It violates the rule of the middling democracy, this middling philosophy that creates associations rather than disassociation. Now, with Themistocles, this rise of, of uh, economic um, uh, and, empowerment and growth of wealth, it creates a transformation of the language within uh, the culture of Athens itself. Instead of talking about farmers, small farms, families, now we're talking about something bigger. Now we're talking about trade. Now we're talking about an Athenian empire. Now we're talking about a way in which the market itself has grown Athens into something great. Three things I'll leave you with to understand what happened as a result of this, this um, encroachment of, of, of a market mentality in the language of democracy. Right at the heart of the, the golden age of Athenian democracy, we've got Pericles. He does three important things. One thing is he creates a strategy for the defense of Athens and their war against Sparta. Here's what's interesting about it. The war that he chooses to fight is a defensive war and a war that's fought on the sea. He leaves all those small farms on the outside of Athens, he lets them burn. The small farmer goes under. Well, why is that? Because the small farmer had lost its voice. The middling democracy had been violated, and what was important in driving the Athenian identity was now this market financial empire. Right? Second thing, they finished just before the opening of uh, the, the um, uh, um, uh, Peloponnesian War, they finished building the Acropolis. You go to the Acropolis and you see a monument, a monument, right, to market expansion itself. The, in the, the Parthenon, as you go around the Acropolis, you come finally to the Parthenon and you come into, the, into, the, into this huge open room. And at the end is a 40 foot tall statue holding a 10 foot high um, a golden uh, image of, uh, of uh, victory itself. And what happens behind that, that, that statuary, that structure of the Parthenon, is it opening up at the port of Piraeus. It's the way that we see a promise of victory by Athena herself, delivered to Athens on this expansion of Athenian orientation away from the small farms into the port itself, to create this reinforcement of a symbolic understanding that the small farmer, the middling philosopher, is dead. The last thing they do is they've got Pericles' great funeral relation that if you were born in a different century, you all would have had it memorized. We don't do that anymore. And the, the, the key to understanding the, the, the funeral oration that he unfolds is that it's a brand new rhetoric. It's a rhetoric that's founded in the language of the market and of a, of a sensibility of the agora as defining the heart of what Athens is all about. Now, these, theme, these things seem normal to us. Well, of course those are good for democracy, but they weren't. They created a language of disassociation and material things and the acquisition of things and an orientation of the whole idea of democracy around things rather than ideas and people and association. And with, within the, the uh, conclusion of the, um, uh, of the Peloponnesian War, Athens herself is going to fall back into tyranny and to a rule that um, uh, uh, will never look back to this one golden age of experience of democracy. It was built not upon a language of capitalism or market freedoms. It was built upon a language of mutual association and identities that looked to look for a social orientation that was built on ethics and morality, family, and um, uh, the deem itself. So this is what I charge for us to do. The way we think about uh, participatory democracy is all maybe wrong. Maybe we should go back to the way the Greeks did. And we should start thinking about maybe your association should have come through politics, or maybe it shouldn't have come through the ways in which we see a development of party mentalities, or even through uh, movements that are involved in institutions themselves. But we should band together as human beings, as a dean. You can make a dean right here. You can be everyone in this room that starts reapproaching how we talk about the language of democracy itself. That's what has to change. It's not the things, it's not the institutions how we understand the possibilities of democratic association itself. And we reinstitute the Dean baby. We go Dean in 2012. You can go Obama, you can go Romney, or you can go Dean. Um, <laughs> if you want to restore your democracy, you go Dean. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>